I would like for you to do me a favor. I want you to close your eyes. Close your eyes and imagine. Imagine that you're a samurai living in feudal Japan. Before you is a long road lined with sweet-smelling cherry blossoms that are in full bloom. Your wooden sandals clacking softly against the carved stone beneath you, echoing as the birds and insects sing. The warm April sun is shining and a cool spring breeze flows through your robes. As you turn the corner, however, you see a figure in the distance, appearing as if he were waiting for you. With the katana in hand, his frame is that of a warrior, possibly a ronin seeking to prove his worth. It's hard to make out the exact details of your opponent. You notice his body outlined with a blue and white robe, but even at this distance, you can see his striking blue eyes. He does not charge or retreat, or rather stares directly at you, almost as if he were speaking to you with his eyes. The man slowly shifts his weight as he steps towards you. Knowing what is coming, your hands grasp at the hill of your own katana, unsheathing the sword as the blade sings softly. The intent is all too clear. This will be a fight to the death. All it takes is one clean hit to decide victory and defeat. You gaze at his stance, seeing his blade held low to his side. You think of lunging in and striking at his exposed neck, but you hesitate. Noticing he is ready to strike you at any moment. His eyes both confidently and nervously pay attention to every movement you make. You remain steady, slowly shifting your weight to the side. You move your blade high above your head to counter his low profile. In his anxiety, he mistakes this movement as an attack, and in a blink of an eye, he turns his blade upwards with such a force that you feel the wind cleave in front of you his whole body rising from the ground from the force of the swing. Time seems to move in slow motion. As he descends, he looks at you and realizes the mistake he made. He closes his eyes, resigning himself to his death. Your grasp tightens on your katana as you instinctively raise your blade and seize this opportunity. Now, open your eyes. <laughs> You have never played a game quite like Bushido Blade. Developed by Lightweight, published by Square, and released in Japan on March 14, 1997, Bushido Blade is one of the most unique fighting games to have ever existed. With the formula that has spawned dozens of spiritual successors, but never one that has been able to come close to the legacy brought on by this game. Even though it's been over 18 years, the legend known as Bushido Blade still lives on. I'm not the first to tell you that Bushido Blade is far from your typical fighter. There are no health bars, there are no time limits. It is one shot, one kill. However, to say that Bushido Blade is a game where you die in one hit is doing the game a disservice, and it's missing the very intricate design of what made Bushido Blade so successful. But before we get into that though, let's take a look at the history of Bushido Blade. If you heard of the company Lightweight, it's because of Bushido Blade, and pardon the pun, and trust me, there are a lot of them, the one hit wonder for the company. In November in 1995, Tetsu Mizuno founded the company. Tetsu Mizuno, as you might have known, was the president of Square since 1992 and was involved in games such as Chrono Trigger, Super Mario RPG Legend of the Seven Stars, and Final Fantasy VII. Timing of its release shows that it was more likely developed alongside Final Fantasy VII. This was indeed Lightweight's first game, released over a year after its founding. A 
A trailer was released on September 30th, 1996 with Square's preview extra disc. This disc, as you might more commonly remember it by, was the Final Fantasy VII preview disc that released with Square's Tobol No. 1. The trailer showed early concepts of Black Lotus and Mikado, as well as a full motion video of early versions of Utsusimi and Kanuki. Though definitely not finalized in this form, the groundwork had laid out a very interesting game. Is it just me, or does the movement actually look a bit more fluid? Uh, anyway. The next time we would see anything from Bushido Blade would be on PlayStation Underground Square Disc released in mid-1997. Not only did it contain the famous Tifa demo of Final Fantasy VII, but it also contained a trailer and playable demo for Bushido Blade. The trailer was a bit updated and contained a lot more gameplay. The levels as well as the animation seemed to be different in the trailer compared to the final version, or even the gameplay demo on the disc, suggesting that was from an earlier build. The gameplay demo is very close to the finished product, containing all the characters, though the only weapon available was a katana. It was released shortly after in America on September 30th, 1997. And too much praise, as most critics loved it. IGN, GameSpot, PlayStation Magazine, and Game Informer giving it very high scores. Selling over a million copies throughout its life, its legacy would see it re-released in Japan in 2007 during its 10-year anniversary. However, what made the game so great? Was it just the concept of realistic combat? Did Bushido Blade succeed entirely by being just a novel idea? Well, its novelty, as well as being pushed side by side with Final Fantasy VII, is what put it on the radar. However, games with novel concepts typically don't age well, especially an early PlayStation era fighter. But I'd argue that Bushido Blade has not only stood the test of time, but has also gotten better with age. <laughs> Let's get this out of the way first. Bushido boasted a unique style that was different from any other fighter. Unlike other weapon based fighters such as Soul Blade or even Battle Arena Toshiden, there were no health bars to Bushido Blade. Hell, there was barely even a heads up display. Combat was designed to be realistic and deadly. It was one sword stroke that was the difference between victory and defeat. It wasn't just that though. Even the hits that wouldn't kill you would still have an impact on your character. For example, taking a blow to your offhand would disable it, leaving you unable to use your throwing weapon. A shot to the legs would leave you crippled, only able to crawl on the ground. Any other non-lethal hit would still have an impact, slowing your character down. For example, a character who might have started off fast and agile would suddenly respond sluggishly and be more open after a few hits. The design alone changed the entire concept of how you would play a fighting game. In Battle Arena Toshiden, for example, you would have no problem charging into an opponent that if you knew, it, even in the worst case scenario, you would only lose a quarter of your health bar. In Bushido Blade, however, even if you were completely unscathed and your opponent was lying before you, injured and weak, he was still a threat. Combat became more reactionary, defensive, ponderous, strategic. You had to really think about what you were doing. If you charged in, your opponent can anticipate your movement and kill you right there. If you missed, you could be completely exposed and cut down. If your opponent was stronger and you parried when you should have dodged or attacked, you guessed it, dead. The game wasn't about memorizing combos or being frame perfect. Yes, timing was important, but more important was spacing and mental strategy. Success is knowing where to hit your enemy and where he can hit you. Knowing how your character and weapon compared to your opponent and their weapon choice. While a little awkward to those who were used to traditional fighters, it was fairly intuitive. It felt natural and at the time realistic. Well, except maybe that. This, combined with the ambience, the lack of HUD, and the focus it required, really sucked you into the immersion. The controls sometimes felt stiff, and maybe even a bit too slow, and this was a common criticism. Your attacks felt a little slower than what they should be, and there was no moving or canceling out. You were committed. If you changed your mind after pressing the button, you had to live or die by the consequences. Moving, dodging, parrying seemed responsive but sluggish. It might come across as awkward at first, but I'll argue that this was an intentional design that led to a better game. This style did not allow for button mashing. 
Sure, you could randomly press buttons to get an easy kill, mostly because your opponent wasn't expecting an attack, but more often than not, panic fire leads to opening yourself to a more precise counterattack. Because the game was slower, reaction times didn't have to be as sharp, giving you slightly more time to get out of the way or respond with an attack of your own. You still had to be quick, but you weren't required to have twitch reflexes. And though being able to cancel your attack mid-swing would probably lead to an interesting opportunity to feint, it would also hinder the commitment to throwing an attack, making combat less tense. Because each side was contemplating, thinking, anticipating, the combat became a slow game of chess. In a world of Marvel vs. Capcom where aggression and risk is often rewarded, this idea for a slow burn fight seems boring to some, and admittedly it's not everyone's cup of tea. However, what this exemplified was the pacing. It would start off slow, yes, but it wasn't just waiting. You would be focused, looking for your chance to strike, trying to find weakness. Your opponent would be doing the same. You adopt a different stance, thinking of your next move, and your foe sees this as his opportunity. He would lunge at you and you'd hold your breath and feel every muscle tense and hope your reflexes were enough to avoid death. He misses, and as the blade passes you by, you quickly try to seize your advantage and strike back. You hit your opponent, but the wound isn't deadly, and he rolls away and you miss with your follow through. You go to charge, but he's ready before you can press the advantage, so you hesitate. And once again, the battle returns to a focused, defensive match. This ebb and flow of combat, a calm before the storm followed by a loud explosion, then complete silence. The anxiety of knowing that all it takes is one slip for a game over. The game, with its pacing, teaches you how to best play it. Then ultimately, like a Kensai, you eventually enter this zen-like state where you aren't thinking at all. And this is mandatory to get everything out of the game. Pacing is what defines Bushido Blade as its own. It's not just about swinging fast and hard or being aggressive. It's about timing, it's about patience, it's about strategy. And while a fast-paced, deadly combat game can be enjoyable, Bushido Blade slows it down to allow you to savor its combat and its mechanics. But it's more to it than just pacing. There is a surprising amount of depth to Bushido Blade that makes it as memorable as it is, and it would be a dishonor not to talk about it. First of all, this game has a sense of style. With no health bars or time limits in the way, the game has a very cinematic feel to it. It's as if you're watching an old samurai movie, as opposed to playing a video game. The aesthetic is very nice, and you can even turn the game to a grayscale mode and really give it that extra edge. Though the graphics are definitely PlayStation 1 graphics, there is a lot of detail. Backgrounds are well rendered and the scenery is nice. Even if there is a bit of fog, it just adds to the effect. The music is awesome. With a mixture of rock and traditional Japanese to get you really pumped. But there's also an ambience that helps give a sense of immersion as well. Character models are colorful. <clears throat> colorful. There we go. And well detailed with effects such as hair and clothing moving in the wind. When you die, the screen counts down to continue as drums and heartbeats echo, only to have your character's eyes snap open with the rematch. But there are a lot of little details added as well. For instance, in story mode, if your character gets injured during a previous fight, they will often show battle damage such as bloody clothes, bandages, or an eye patch in the next scene. Falling into a mud pit will kick mud all over their character model. You can leave footprints in the snow, and there's even a bamboo forest which you can fight in. Cutting them will cause them to dramatically slide and fall over, but if you hit it with a blunt weapon, your weapon would just be knocked aside as if you hit something solid. Lightweight had thought of everything. Even the weight of the character and weapon you chose will affect how your character fights in the wind. Each character is arranged by how big they are, with lighter characters being quicker and able to dodge faster, though their attacks are weaker and might not score a killing blow as often. Stronger characters are often slower, but their attacks are able to kill more efficiently, but this also depends on their weapon. 
There are eight different weapons, a katana, a nodachi, a saber, or ninja toe more precisely, a rapier, a longsword, a broadsword, a naginata, and a mother effing sledgehammer. <laughs> Every character wields each weapon somewhat proficiently, but they handle some better than others. As you would expect, lighter characters typically handle light weapons such as a saber or longsword well, whereas bigger characters handle heavier weapons such as the nodachi or broadsword better. But this isn't always the case. For example, Black Lotus, no, not that Black Lotus, handles the rapier very well. Utsusemi is the master with the lighter katana. Mikado, on the other hand, handles the naginata fairly well. Tatsumi, on the other hand, well, maybe a sledgehammer isn't a good idea. Those who specialize in certain weapons get a slight boost in speed and damage. They also get special moves that are exclusive to them as well. Again, Black Lotus with his rapier gives him the ability to do a thousand stabs. Mikado can vault into the air with her naginata. And Tatsumi with his sledgehammer. Yeah. But just because a weapon is more preferred doesn't mean that they are limited to that selection. Since the game relies so much on timing and skill, these make little difference. In fact, Kanuki with the saber or Red Shadow with an Odachi are just as deadly as the other way around. Heavier weapons in combination with your character's strength allow you to parry attacks. Kanuki with the sledgehammer will absolutely destroy any attempts to block, but even Tatsumi with the sledgehammer can deflect an attack or cause an opponent to have to dodge. Likewise, Kanuki with the longsword can crush defenses of a lighter opponent and match their speed. Each weapon also has three separate stances, a high, mid, and low stance, with a variety of moves able to be done from each. These stances can be changed in mid-battle and provide certain advantages and disadvantages. A mid-stance typically keeps your weapon out in front, keeping your opponent a distance away and may passively protect your body from attacks. Moves from here are often versatile and can attack at any angle. A high stance will expose your legs and torso to attack, but are often quick and devastating as gravity does the job for you. And a low stance will expose your head to attack, but are often quicker and more unpredictable. Knowing your character, weapon, and stances are all keys that will lead you to victory on your journey. Speaking of journey, I haven't talked about the story mode yet. Yes, this was a Square game, and as such, it was required to have some sort of story mode. The story is... well... it's not the strongest aspect of the game. From what I gather, you're an assassin in an assassin school, then you don't like assassinating anymore, but the school has a strict resonations and unaccepted policy, causing your friends to go after you and murder you. I think, at least. Each character's story seems to be slightly different, and has all the other playable cast trying to kill your character instead of escaping. This is possibly due to a cursed sword which drove your master insane. I'm not quite sure I understand it, but for the tone of the game, it works. However, story mode is just too easy. Your fellow assassins feel the need to introduce themselves right before combat, giving you plenty of time to stab him in the face. Do that a few times and... Wait, that's... that's it? After four or five fights, it just comes to this screen? Well, remember, this is Bushido Blade. Bushido. As in, the code the samurai used when conducting themselves in battle. Honesty, courage, compassion, courtesy, sincerity, loyalty, honor. Fail to follow these virtues and you will not see the end of the game. Well, at least follow the code in the way the game can recognize. This means no stabbing an opponent before they're ready to defend themselves, and you probably shouldn't be using tactics like throwing mud in their eye or hitting them while they're down either. The AI, however, has no problem with being dishonorable. Following these rules and beating four player characters, your character will run a little bit, jump down the well and fight the fifth one. And defeating him while keeping your honor intact takes you to the more experienced bosses, including Katze, who uses a gun?
What the hell? Why is there a guy using a Mauser C96? Isn't this the Edo period? Okay, well, maybe this is like a last samurai era, and the guy is just using anachronism. Wait a second. Hold the phone. Am I on a helipad? Okay, so you're telling me that I am playing a character who dresses out as if they're in the Edo period, and fights with the sword in a time where I could probably get a snipe rifle and solve this problem quickly. No, wait, not only that, but I'm an assassin. But by the looks of it, rather than sit on a grassy knoll and wait for my target to come by, I instead bum rush him with a sledgehammer. Then I just leave blood and broken teeth everywhere in a world where forensic science exists. And despite all that, we are, number one, able to not have our operation blown by any local or federal investigation, and two, somehow we are able to get work despite all this? Kage assassinations. I want my wife killed. You need your wife killed? Yep. Yeah, that's what looks like an accident. And you need to look like some sort of accident? Yep. Well, I mean, that's good and all, but it's very difficult to do in our line of work. What we, do? we can, however, make it look like some random crime. Alright, what gun are you gonna use? Uh, guns? Yeah. Uh, well, we can, but. No, oh. It's just that it's not very sporting. Uh, we prefer to use other weapons, like you what? know, katanas, rapiers, mother effing sledgehammers. Yes, I said sledgehammer. Yes, that's right. Sir, I'll have you know that the sledgehammer is the most honorable, and might I add, effective weapons that we use. It's very brutal. Yes, it's very brutal. How are you gonna do it? What's that? Oh, how we're gonna do it? Well, it's simple. First, we go to your wife and announce our presence and give her a chance to fight us honorably in one-on-one -on -one combat. And then, if she kills one of our assassins, we just send another until- Sir? Hello? Hello? Ah, oh, he hung up. I don't get it. I mean, I'll give Bushido Blade all the credit in the world for being an excellent game, but I just don't understand the story. Especially, this is coming from Square, who gave a passable story to pretty much every game it made. Perhaps if there was a bit more world building and a better explanation of the plot, maybe they just wanted to avoid being too cliche. But overall it doesn't make much sense. I mean, we're assassins, right? Killing people for money? Doesn't that just make us the bad guys and the master just the... badder guy? Even worse, to unlock the real ending, you're made to jump through a bunch of crazy hoops. First, you have to follow the code of Bushido. That's easy enough once you get used to it. Secondly, you have to travel to the well on your own. Oh, yeah, you can travel through the areas in story mode. If you and an enemy are close enough to the zone, the game will load to the next area. While it's a really interesting concept, and I love the idea of an open world arena, this unfortunately isn't taken advantage of, since there are no areas that really give you a strategic advantage. Anyway, once you get to the well, you must cripple your opponent's legs, then jump in, which automatically takes you to the last fight. Doing so, and you'll be on your path to all the bosses. Oh, by the way, the hardest part? You cannot be hit once. No, I didn't misspeak and say you cannot die once. You cannot take even a minor paper cut until you defeat the final boss. This is difficult and requires being extremely cautious and patient. That zen-like state I mentioned before? You're gonna need that to be able to keep calm after being hit by a random thrown fan. Are you fucking kidding me? After all that, you'll fight the final secret boss. And fortunately, you are able to die as many times as you want to here. After it's all said and done, you'll unlock a special cutscene that doesn't really explain much of the story. Yeah, thanks Bushido Blade for the offer, but I'm gonna have to pass. Thankfully, Bushido Blade makes up for this in gameplay, but it's otherwise a flaw on what would be a masterpiece game. But the story mode isn't the only option available to you. You have versus mode, which is where the game is probably best experienced. There isn't much to be said that hasn't already been said, but fighting a player-controlled character 
feels so much more strategic and natural than fighting the AI, which, while passable, doesn't have the same feel. Speaking of the AI, training mode allows you to play against it with wooden textured weapons. The nice thing about this mode is that continuing is very quick, and it allows you to get right back into the action with very little loading times. You also have a point of view mode, which instead of the side view, places you in the eyes of your character. I didn't really care for this mode when I was younger outside of a curiosity, but upon replaying it, I really admired the feeling of immersion and having to also deal with the blind spots. One thing I was unfortunately never able to try was Link mode, which is POV mode for two players. This of course required two players, two televisions, two playstations, two copies of the game and a link cable to be able to do it, making it extremely limited. But I can imagine this mode was very fun. Hey, if you ever had experience with this, let me know in the comments. I'm actually genuinely interested in hearing about it. Finally, there is Slash Mode, which is different from anything we've seen in the game thus far. You pick your character as normal, but the katana is automatically selected for you. You are then put in a hallway with ninja blindly slashing in the air. Like the badass you are, you easily dispatch him, only to have another one appear. This mode puts you against 100 enemies one at a time, each progressively getting harder, smarter, and stronger as you continue on. Usually with a pattern of 9 mooks then 1 boss. Most of them have a simple attack pattern, but the trick is knowing when to strike. Your character will inevitably slow down from all the cuts and nicks they'll receive, and you'll lapse in judgment and be cut down. However, you'll start from the last 10's digit, so with some casual play you'll be able to beat this mode in some time. But if you wish to unlock Katze in Versus mode, you can't die once. Now, I appreciate a challenge. Growing up on Nintendo hard games, I understand that you need to be good to get the rewards. But the mastery and patience required for these are almost maddening. Just like a sword fight, you need to be on your guard at all times. Even a single mistake can mean death and having to start all over. I feel this was probably intentional, as they really wanted to drive the point forward that this was indeed the most realistic fighting game ever. Doing so cultivated a high skill level, but after a while you need to understand that it is just a game in the end. Then again, I put myself through harder games, and it's not the worst of challenges if you are willing to sink some time into it. However, you don't really need an extra cutscene or use an unlockable guy with a gun to fully enjoy the game. Without the unlockables or really even the story, the whole experience is enjoyable. It's not for everyone, and I can imagine people who expect more fluid controls and free flowing combos might get bored of it fairly quick. Bushido Blade is definitely an acquired taste, but I imagine it's palatable for most. Especially if you can appreciate the opera beauty of early polygonal games. I would definitely say Bushido Blade has aged well. There is some dust, but the overall experience is just as good now as it was 18 years ago. Could it have been better? Sure, there are a lot of things that could have been improved and added, but the game was fine for what it was. Sometimes complexity comes from simplicity. But with all that said, and with all the success Bushido Blade had, why wasn't there a sequel? I mean, Square wasn't exactly Capcom, but most of their other successful titles at least had some sort of sequel. Well, if you know your history, you know Bushido Blade did have its return only a year later. So how can we all talk about Bushido Blade but not its successor? And what happened to Lightweight? Well, I hate to be a bit of a tease, but we'll save that for next time. What I really wanted to focus on in this episode was the intentional design of Bushido Blade and why that design has rang so clearly that you can hear it today, even if it has been muffled a bit by the seas of time. I also wanted to point out why game design is important. There are reasons that we're talking about games such as Shenmue or Okami well after they've been relevant in popular media. These games are designed in such a way that like a good story or song have an impact in our lives. We don't just play good games, we experience them. It might not change our mindset noticeably, 
but we take a small, minor part of that and it might stick with us in our thoughts and expressions. In a way, you can say that gaining that experience builds character. This has been Soberdorf. Thanks for watching. Hey, uh, you just watched my first video. Was it good for you? I was really nervous my first time, but you were really good. Listen, I don't want to be weird or anything, but if you want to watch it again, I'm, I'm willing. You can subscribe if you want to. No pressure, though. If subscribing is, like, too much commitment, you could at least tell me if you liked it? Or would that be weird, too?